Okay, so this lesson tonight is my absolute favorite one, and it's going to teach you how to dream on the daily. And if I could have put this one at the very beginning, I would have had my dream come true, but I wanted to walk you through the process. And this is also the piece that I think most people get most confused about, about when they read the book is because they read the book thinking that we're going to talk about what we're talking about in this lesson, which is how do I dream with God? every day and run towards those dreams every single day. But what we didn't realize is that there's just a lot of mindsets and heart sets that have to be reestablished so that I can actually align with what heaven is doing. But today we're actually going to talk about what does it mean to dream on the daily and why this is so important is because it starts to get all up close and personal with how we run our day, which is seen in this idea of a routine. Now, I would like to propose that all of you don't not have a routine. It's just the fact that we don't necessarily have what's called an aligned routine. So what we're doing is ensuring that our routines are in alignment with where we're going and not just what we've always done. And if you look at the definition of routine, routine means a sequence of actions regularly followed. But upon further research, it says a fixed program performed as a part of a regular procedure rather than a special reason. If that like doesn't make you so uncomfortable and uneasy, I don't know what does. What does that mean? It means that we have a routine, but it's just a fixed program. It's an unconscious response to doing what we've always done. And so our routines are actually built upon comfort, not growth. They're built upon same thing, different day which means most of us, again, don't have a routine based upon the dreams that God's given us. We just have a routine that we've run out for so long that we just know it and we do it. So my question to all of us is, is your morning routine getting you to where you want to be? And that's why we have to do inventory. Is your morning routine getting you to where you ultimately want to be? And for most of us, we would say no, but we're ready. We're ready to wake up and we're ready to wholeheartedly chase after the dreams that God has given us in our faith, our family, our career, and our community. And that's what we're going to ensure that we do. So when we lean into this, there is a guiding scripture that I want us to consider every single moment of every single day as we run out this new routine. Um, and that is from Psalms 55, 17. And it says, every evening I will explain my need to him. And every morning I will move my soul towards him. Every waking hour, I will worship only him, and he will hear me and he will respond to my cry. Why I think that this is such an important scripture to lean into is because we have to realize that every single night we have to learn how to move our need towards him. We have to take our need to him. It's going, some days are going to be very heavy. Some days are going to be very hard. Some days are going to feel like you're getting nowhere. It's going to feel like getting out of the boat was the worst idea you ever did. And so you're going to have to be very comfortable in taking your need to him on the, every single night. You're also going to have to get very comfortable in understanding how do you move your soul towards him every single morning? And then how do we actually bridge the gap is that every single moment of every single day, I am worshiping him and only him. Not what I see, not my, not my circumstances, but worshiping him and only him. And this is where enters my favorite part of this whole entire process is then how do we dream on the daily, not in theory, not in a vision board session, but on the daily. So if you open up the journal, this is actually the simplest process that I could give you, which is how to do this in 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day. So for anyone who says, I don't have enough time to do this, coming from a mom of five, I got you. If I can do this, you could do this too. Well, so where you will start is just 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day, that's where I started. I'm in this now for a couple of years. I have two hours every single morning that I carve out. I start at 4.30 in the morning. And the reason I start at 4.30 in the morning is because generally my kids are up at 6.30 and I want two hours, but I did not start that way. I started with, all right, God, you got 15 minutes. <laughs> you got, it's funny to look back. You got 15 minutes and you know what? You better show up. But here's the process and here's what's transformed my life and gone from 15 minutes of I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this for 66 days. And if it works, maybe I'll consider doing it. And it's turned into now a movement two hours a day for me. And it's something that is my non-negotiable. So step number one, 
breath. You have to breathe. The, there's so many benefits of breath work, physical benefits first and foremost, which I think I, I want to make sure that all of us understand because we all hear the concepts of breath, but we don't really understand the benefits. It nourishes your body. It oxygenates your cells. It promotes healing in the body. It boosts your immune system. It calms your mind. It quiets the chatter. I <laughs> get this. Even research shows that it aligns the mind, the heart, and the body. Breath is alignment. But check this out. Breath is translated as spiritus in Latin. Do you know where I'm going with this? Spirit is actually derived from the word breath. What does that mean? It means that spirit and breath are one in the same. Check out what it says in Romans. Romans 8 verse 1. So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. For the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. Yet God sent us his son in human form to identify with human weakness. Clothed with humanity, God's son gave his body to be the sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and the power of sin. So now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. And we are free to live, not according to our flesh, but by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Check that out. It says, and we are free to live, not according to our flesh, but according to the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Now think about this again, spirit and breath. I want you to consider that this is one and the same. Then it continues on in verse five. It says, those who are motivated by the flesh only pursues what, uh, what benefits themselves. But those who live by the impulses of the Holy Spirit are motivated to pursue spiritual realities. For the senses and reason of the flesh, flesh is death, but the mindset controlled by the Spirit finds life and peace. And in fact, the mindset focused on the flesh fights God's plan and refuses to submit to his direction because it cannot. For no matter how hard they try, God finds no pleasure with those who are controlled by the flesh. What does this mean? It means that breath is always available to us. You and I don't have to think about actually breathing. It just happens. The same is true with the spirit. The spirit is there all the time all the time. However, breath like the Holy Spirit is always there, but when you activate it, it takes on a whole new meaning and place of power in your life. This is what I need you to understand about why you start your morning routine with breath. Breath actually activates the spirit. The spirit's already there. Your breath is already happening, but by you deciding to sit down and five deep breaths, what it does is it activates it. So here's the spiritual benefits of breath work is that it's going to key you into greater awareness to what God is already doing. You're not breathing just for the physical benefits. You're, breath you're breathing to gain greater awareness of what the spirit is already doing. It's an alignment play of mind, body, and heart with heaven. It releases the weight of this world and it exchanges his yoke, which is easy. And then it activates the Holy Spirit within you. This is why we take five breaths to start this process out by breathing. It's our first step to take alignment with going, I'm going to activate my breath and I'm going to activate my spirit. Now, when we do that, then we can move into part two, which is gratitude. Gratitude is super important in this process just simply because it's, um, it, it is the ability for us to recognize that I need to get my mind right because some mornings you're going to wake up and just have a poopy attitude. You're not going to want to do it. You're not going to want to feel like doing it. You're going to feel like, uh, I have other things that I want to do and I, I don't want to do this whole process. And at one moment you're going to go, wait a minute, that's not how we think about this. And we're going to dive into a place of deep gratitude. What is gratitude? The benefits of gratitude and why we do this physically is because we want to reduce depression. It can actually lessen anxiety. It supports your heart health. It relieves stress. It improves sleep. Doctors have even said that it's the healthiest emotion. Get that. And they say that it shapes your brain. How does it shape your brain? 
All of us know that every time we think a thought, it creates a new pathway in the brain. Every time I'm thinking a grateful thought, it's actually carving a new neural pathway in the brain to be receptive on what? On God. That's ultimately what we're doing and why we're being grateful. Now, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. Here's why we practice gratitude in this moment. Gratitude honors who God is, not what God does for you. It, we love what God does for us. I think it's amazing to have a whole list of all the things that God's done for you, but that's not why we do gratitude. Gratitude honors the essence of who he is. I am grateful for who you are, God, and not just what you do. That takes us to a whole new level of revelation. Which, which introduces us to the spiritual benefits of gratitude. Number one, when I align with this pra practice of gratitude, it gets my posture in the right place. My mind and my heart is on heaven, not circumstances. I'm not thankful for the things. I'm thankful for the one who holds the things, which means and it honors who God is and not just what he does for me. It helps me to then build fellowship with him not just on things, but on character and identity of him and me. It deepens my trust in him. It strengthens my faith and it becomes my greatest place of witness and testimony to the world around me. Because when people go, what, what, why are you so happy in the midst of circumstances? Or what do you have to be grateful for? You go, you must not understand the character of God. People will go, well, why does God let bad things happen to good people? You go, he's not done. My God is not done. And I, I pray and praise a God who is not done. He's the beginning and the end, and he doesn't bow his knee to circumstances. This is why we practice gratitude. Gratitude enables us to ultimately see the hand of God in our lives. This is why it's step number two and so important in this process. Now, with my practice of gratitude, sometimes it starts as simple as this cup of coffee. I love the smell of this cup of coffee. And then it goes, oh, this my house is quiet. Being a mom of five, that doesn't happen often. But then all of a sudden I'm like, God, but you're so good. You gave me five babies. You're giving me the capacity to raise them well. All of a sudden you go, but in, in who you are, you love me where I'm at. And you've been with me this entire process. And then you were with me from the beginning of time. And all of a sudden what it does is it just walks you up the scale of being grateful for the littlest things like coffee, all the way to the magnitude of his goodness. It's the most incredible aligning practice and part of this whole piece. Once you do that, it's step three. Step three is visualization. Now, visualization, most people have a huge misunderstanding as to what visualization is. We think that visualization um, is designed to make us feel good. It is not designed to make you feel good. It's designed to make you be good. But there's three things that I want you to understand around visualization and why it is so important in this process. Number one, it strengthens your eyes of faith. You have faith eyes, believe it or not. All of us do. And, and Helen Keller says this all the time, or one of the quotes that I quote all the time, which is, I don't care what you look at. I care what you see. And Hebrews is so clear on the type of eyes that we're supposed to be having as believers, which is our faith eyes, which says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So when I close my eyes and I visualize the prophecies and the dreams and the things that God has spoken over my life, I actually start to partner with those things. And when I do that, I actually start to go, okay, I, I now depend less on what's going on around me and I'm depending more on what God is doing within me. When I do that, it ultimately starts to help me normalize heaven's realities, which is number two power behind visualization is that when I close my eyes and I start to picture a world that I physically can't see, I picture the book being completed. I picture the business that he's asked me to write. I picture my marriage being connected. I picture me being a healthy person. What I'm doing is I'm actually starting to partner and normalize heaven's realities. And why this is important is because it helps us to avoid very earthly carnal, weird things that we tend to do like self-sabotage and imposter syndrome. Anyone raise your hand? Who's good at that? Who's good at that? Well, self-sabotage and imposter syndrome happen when we're out of alignment 
What does that mean? It means that I've actually not closed my eyes enough to recognize what God's doing within me. So when it starts to happen around me, uh, the two worlds are out of alignment. And so I sabotage this world to fit this world. And if this world says that God doesn't have my back or it's never going to be good enough, then I need to make sure that this world is in alignment with this world. So by closing my eyes and actually visualizing the things that God has asked me to do, the dreams that he's placed in my heart, it allows my internal world and my heavenly world to start to align. So that way, then when I go out to live in the real world, it's a byproduct of the world that he's creating within me. It's, it's hugely powerful to this process. Once I'm able to do that, and if I can close my eyes and I can see it in my mind's eye, then I start the next process in the power of visualizing, which is then I need to plan the dive and dive the plan. What does that mean? Well, it says it in Habakkuk 2. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelations and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it for the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and it will not delay. The reason that I have you visualize it and then put a picture to it is number one, to get your ego out of the way. I can't tell you how many people say to me, well, I just don't draw. You're like, okay, well, Moses also didn't part Red Seas and Noah had never built an ark. And so no one's going to die if you draw a horrible picture. And P.S., kill the ego. It's designed to get you to take what you can visually see in your mind's eye, what you can feel in your heart and in your soul, what, what heaven's realities are speaking, what the word of God, what the prophecies that have been spoken over your life. It's your ability to start taking that and putting pen to paper and writing it clearly on tablets. Why? So you can do something about it. We want you to take that vision, to take that dream and to be able to do something with it because there's no way to do the next step if you aren't able to clearly write it in picture form, color form, word form. Heck, don't hide behind, just draw a picture. Just get it out of your head and onto paper so you can do step four, which is one of the most impactful pieces to this whole thing, which is dream stacking. And dream stacking is a phrase that I've coined that really nobody has any idea what I'm talking about until you're in this internal community and then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But for the sake of the exercise, here's what it means to dream stack. It's a practice of setting and achieving small manageable dreams on the daily. Or another way to say this is that dream stacking equals your ability to bridge the gap. So do you remember when all y'all signed up for this and you said, here's my dream. Here's my reality. Here's the prophecy. Here's the fulfillment of that prophecy. And there is this big gap in between. So there's all this framework and things that are going to help me bridge the gap. But ultimately what bridges the gap is small bite-sized action steps towards your big God-sized bold dreams every single day. This is my favorite part. This is the part that when you actually look at this journal and you go, okay, okay, I'm, I'm taking deep breaths. I'm totally grateful. I visualize what God's saying over my life. Now it's time to do something towards three dreams that God has, three action items. All of us can manage three things every single day to move towards where we're going. This is where we create a new routine because instead of just doing all of the things that keep you comfortable, you're actually going to learn how to do three things every single day that take you out of the boat of comfortability, get you walking on water towards God and towards heaven's realities. And what it does is it develops sea legs, sea legs that help you do the impossible, that help you watch the Red Sea part, that help you build the ark. Like, you no, know, what did they do? Noah just was faithful in building a little bit of the ark every single day. Dream stacking is going to be the three things that you choose to do every single day to help you bridge the gap. Dream stacking will cause you to act your way to a new way of thinking and a new way of feeling. Why this is so important is because there will be days that you go, mm -mm, I don't, I don't, I'm not thinking heaven's thoughts. Great. I get that. 
you have thoughts. You're not your thoughts. You're like, well, I don't feel like doing it. No, you have emotions. You're not your emotions. And dream stacking will force you to act your way to a new way of thinking and to act your way to a new way of feeling. Which then at that point in time, once we put those things down in our journal, we're going to go to step five, which is to meditate on God's word. Now, meditate by definition means to think deeply or to focus one's mind for a period of time. But here's what it also means that I think is really fascinating is that it's a type of mind-body medicine. It's a mental exercise for the purpose of reaching a heightened level of spiritual awareness. There's two trains of thought here. The world tells us that meditation is where you empty your mind. Scripture tells us we need to fill our mind with God's truth. Here's what I'd like to propose. Do both. <laughs> right? Because even if I'm filling my mind with God's truth on a faulty mindset of a bunch of lies that are just like jarred up in there, right? It, it's, it's hard to translate. So the idea of this is when I start to practice meditating on God's word, I need to empty all the things that are not in alignment with the truth. And then I need to fill it with what? Truth. I need to meditate and I need to think deeply and focus my mind on truth, not fact. And this is our invitation to do that. It's to take our dreams and now go, all right, now I need truth. I don't want fact. It says in the word, in God's word, Joshua 1, verse 8, keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Psalms 1, Verse one says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. All he does prospers. We all want to prosper. But if you notice in both of those scriptures, what it says is that prospering is a byproduct of what? Meditation. On what? God's word. And so in this piece, you're going to recognize that your morning meditations unto the Lord are your first fruits of your time and your attention. That's why we're going to do it at the beginning of our day. No questions asked is because it's our ability to go, God, you get my first when it comes to my time and my attention. Then when that piece is done, we're going to lean into step six, which is where we actually get to learn. We need to learn the lessons that God is really trying to teach us throughout this process, because he's always inviting us to learn even more. If you look at the definition of learning, it's the process of acquiring new understanding, knowledge, behavior, skills, values, attitude, and preferences. The biblical meditation, though, is learning the words of scripture with a receptive heart and trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to work in you and through you. When we start to lean into his scripture, he's going to invite us into learning something about him and ourselves that we don't yet understand, which means he's going to blow our minds. And in this place in your quiet time, you start to write about the things that you're learning so he can work in and through you in the way that he wants to. God it isn't using this piece to shine your weaknesses. He's inviting you to embrace his unconditional love for you to abide in him and to show you that in your greatest place of weakness is his greatest place of impact. And so your need in this area, the lessons that you're learning are going to draw you in into a closer understanding and relationship with him. This, key, this is key. Now, once you're all up close and personal in God's business and he's in your business, we're going to solidify our morning practice with step number seven, which is affirmation. We need to actually leave our quiet time and our quiet space with the Lord, remembering who we are because of whose we are. And for most at this point in time, our identity has been shaped based upon our behavior. And so we, we, we are our behavior instead of realizing that actually our behavior should be a byproduct of our identity. And so when we use this opportunity to lean in and to affirm who we are, it puts our identity in front of our behavior and it tells our behavior, no, 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 I am not how I behave. I am who God says I am. 
And each day you're going to end your morning meditations with a strong affirmation around who God says that you are. Affirm by definition actually means a statement or proposition that is declared to be true. So why this is important is that even though fact might tell you that you've been failing or fact might say that you've missed the mark, truth has a different statement. And so affirmation is declaring truth. It's not lowering your standard to fit the facts. So your daily affirmation is going to align your behavior with your identity, the truth of your identity versus allowing your behavior to be defined by your identity. It's never about doing this the right way, by the way. It's never about doing this, right? Saying I have enough time. Uh, is this the right way? The idea here is that you're just learning to create alignment and alignment with the priorities. What are the priorities? The dream that God has for you and learning to make decisions every single day towards those dreams. This is the magic of dream stacking. This is your morning routine.